Hi, my name is Dr. Louis Mock from the Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. In this short podcast, I'm going to go through the approach to using ultrasound as an adjunct in central neuro neuroaxial blocks like spinal anesthesia or epidural analgesia. Now, these blocks is one of the most widely practiced techniques of regional anesthesia. Um, the service landmark based approach would be adequate in a majority of time, although occasionally difficulty may arise. Um, for instance, in patients with really difficult anatomy of the spine. So it is in these occasions that ultrasound might be quite useful. And I'm going to illustrate it by way of a case scenario. So imagine you're working in an emergency theater alone and an 83 year old gentleman is booked onto your list for a fracture of his right hip. He was admitted following a low energy trauma, um, but it gave rise to quite a significant injury. Apart from fracture of his right hip, he also suffered fracture of the right distal radius as well as right facial fa fracture. He's now scheduled for operation on his right hip only, as the other injuries could be managed in a conservative manner. So let's look at some of the background history of this gentleman. You notice that he suffers from carcinoma of the prostate and already had evidence of bone metastasis when he was diagnosed with the carcinoma three years ago. At that point, the metastasis was confined to the pelvis, although over the intervening years, he did complain of progressively increasing back soreness. Additionally, he's a chronic smoker, and the chest film taken for this admission showed evidence of emphysematous lung changes with a quite a substantial large lung bulla. And most recently, he was admitted for ischemic stroke two months ago. And it was during that episode that he was noted to have um, atrial fibrillation. He was then commenced on prophylactic anticoagulant therapy with a pixaban. Um, in addition, the stroke also left him with residual bulbar palsy. And as a result, he now requires thickener and has um, aspiration risk. So in essence, this is a gentleman in whom you would rather stay away from giving general anesthesia because of the chronic um, cigarette exposure the possibility of compromised respiratory function, as well as uh, the recent stroke, which left him with a high aspiration risk. But at the same time, spinal anesthesia also presents uh, some challenges, especially in reference to the low back pain and the history of bone metastasis, as well as the use of anticoagulant in the form of NOAC. At this point, let us revisit some of the issues with central neuraxial anesthesia in the conventional landmark based technique. Now, spinal anesthesia is a simple technique in the majority of time and produces consistent surgical anesthesia. And that's why it is so popular among anesthesiologists. However, there are moments where even experienced anesthesiologists would come into trouble while performing this technique. For instance, we often encounter patients with difficult spinal anatomy or certain patient condition that would entail significant difficulties. Incidentally, these would often occur in patients in whom non-general anesthesia would be the most beneficial, as in the case of obesity. And those with significant spinal deformities, like kyphoscoliotic spine with impaired lung function, spinal degenerative disease in the elderly population, and those with previous operations on the spine. Furthermore, it was widely acknowledged that the estimation of vertebral body by way of using body landmark like eyelid crest is grossly inaccurate. The surface anatomy is nowhere reliable. <clears throat> and it is for these reasons that spinal anesthesia by way of landmark technique would not be accurate. 
Also, although severe complications as a result of neuraxial procedures are rare, they do occur and may end up pretty detrimental. These complications, in theory, are more frequent after multiple attempts at neuraxial access. However, the number of attempts and the difficulty of spinal access is often not readily predictable by way of um, eyeballing or landmark-based procedure. Patients with difficult spinal anatomy may end up with a failed procedure necessitating general anesthesia, which could otherwise be obviated. Finally, although a rare occurrence, dry spinal tap does occur, which could be a result of low pressure within the intrathecal space. So with this in mind, let's now turn our focus onto the clinical utility of ultrasound and evaluating how ultrasound as a tool could help us to achieve um, spinal or epidural injections. Now, ultrasound-guided neuraxial intervention was described some 40 years ago in the 1970s. Although with the advance of technology and the improvement in sonographic resolution and penetration, there is a renewed interest in, within the community of regional anesthesiologists in the study of using ultrasound as a tool in this regard. Ultrasound as a pre-procedural screening tool has been widely studied. It allows the clinician to accurately locate the midline, the depth of intrathecal or epidural space, and to identify the specific intervertebral space if the procedure so requires. It will also allow for the identification of any rotatory or lateral spinal deformity before the actual procedure. This would be particularly useful in both patients with expected difficulties or in the elderly population with extensive degenerative changes in the lumbar spine. In addition, it also allows the anesthesiologist to pick out in advance patients in whom difficulties might not be readily apparent just by looking at the service landmark. It has been shown that in expert hands, the use of neuraxial ultrasound for epidural needle insertion would reduce the number of needling attempts, improve the success rate of epidural access on first attempt, improve patient comfort and tolerance during the procedure. At the same time, the risk of traumatic procedure is also believed to be mitigated with ultrasound guidance. Theoretically, such benefits might translate into a reduction in potentially devastating complications. And it is worth mentioning that the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence in the UK has made a recommendation to and recommend the routine neuraxial ultrasound to be used for epidural catheterization. Before going into the specifics of ultrasound guided procedure, let's go through some of the relevant anatomy in the, um, in the neighboring structures. Now I'm sure that the anatomy of the lumbar spine shall be familiar to most of us. So here I shall only focus on the issues relevant to ultrasound guided interventions. In this regard, the bony spine is exceptionally important as it is often these bony structures rather than the neural elements or soft tissues that fall under our focus in performing neuraxial ultrasound. The spinous process of lumbar spine project perpendicularly towards the back, and when insinated from the back, the ultrasound wave will be caught by the bony structure. Any neuraxial structure steep to it will fall within the strong acoustic shadow. So, when you put a transducer in a horizontal manner through the spinous process, like in the picture on the left lowest corner, you can only view the spinous process and also the lamina, which sits on the same horizontal level. And these bony structure would cast a very strong acoustic shadow underneath, obscuring any structure deep within it. On the other hand, when the transducers slide either cranially or caudally to the intervertebral space, we will be able to see the neuraxial structures deep within the spinal canal. This is because 
the interspinous um, ligament and the supraspinous ligament that straddles between the spinous processes allows ultrasound penetration. On the same horizontal or transverse plane, you will also find the articular process as well as the spinous process if we extend more laterally. The transverse processes itself are projected horizontally towards each side and would cast a strong acoustic shadow when insinated from the back. What then are the equipments that are necessary in this procedure? Now, we use curvilinear transducer as they offer a wider field of view and allows for deeper penetration into the neuraxial elements, which are often seated at a depth of more than three to four centimeters from the skin. The ultrasound preset should be adjusted to spine. It is important to note that real-time ultrasound guided intervention in the neuraxis, normal saline instead of ultrasound gel should be used as the coupling agent as the gel has been implicated in inflammatory response upon accidental impregnation into the subarachnoid space. And as such, it is contraindicated in neuraxial injections. In my practice, the needle of choice would be a pencil point spinal needle with an 18 gauge introducer needle. The spinal needle itself is not sonogenic. This, together with the steep angulation of insertion, as well as the use of curvilinear transducer, would mean suboptimal echogenicity. The needle itself is often not visualized completely during the procedure, and oftentimes only tissue movements are observed. An introducer needle in this sense would be extremely useful. It is often more echogenic than the spinal needle itself, and during the procedure, the introducer needle is inserted in the orientation that aligns with the target neural elements, serving as a guide to subsequent spinal needle insertion. If available, I would also suggest the use of transparent drapes, so that the alignment of the spine as well as the relationship with the various service landmarks can be ascertained during the procedure. It would often also be helpful to formulate your own routines in scanning when performing ultrasound guided interventions, going through different views in a systematic manner. And for ultrasound assessment of the spine and the relevant neuraxial elements, I would like to share with you the approach that I use as below. Essentially, there are five different views in this routine, three of which are sagittal at different planes, from lateral to medial, Firstly, over the transverse process, then the articular process, and finally, with a slight medial tilt to obtain the paramedian sagittal oblique view. And then there are these two transverse views one directly over the spinous process, the transverse spinous process view, and the other over the interspinous space, the transverse interspinous view. For this procedure, the patient is placed either in the lateral decubitus or the sitting position. The midline is identified first by inspection and palpation of the back, and they are marked accordingly, if possible. The upper edges of the eyelid crest and the posterior superior eyelid spines bilaterally are also marked as reference points. Now we start with the paramedian sagittal view over the transverse process. For this view, the transducer is placed in the lower back, two centimeters lateral to the midline, over the transverse processes of the lumbar spine. The transverse processes appear as um, flat surface, giving rise to strong hyperechoic shadow underneath and obscuring the underlying psoas major muscles. These acoustic shadows resembles the prong of a trident, thus giving rise to the name the trident sign. The erector spiny muscle then lies superficial to the transverse processes. 
you may find a transition between the sacrum and the transverse process of the lower lumbar spine in this image. The sacrum would appear as a horizontal hypercoic structure with underlying acoustic shadow. Accurate determination on the intervertebral space can be ascertained by counting up from, the sonor from this sonographic landmark. From this point onwards, the transducer is slide medially along the same level and in the same orientation until the articular processes are seen. The camel hump sign denotes the sonographic features of the particular processes that appear as one continuous hyperechoic wavy line that resembles multiple rounded camel humps. This is the paramedian sagittal articular process view. With the transducer at the same location, it is now sl tilted slightly towards the midline such that an image through the interlaminar space is obtained. In this view, the lamina is represented by the hyperechoic structure that is discontinuous and slanted. These are conventionally described as sawtooth. Gaps open up in between consecutive lamina through the interlaminar space, permitting ultrasound penetration within the spinal canal. The extent of the spinal canal is delimited by the anterior complex anteriorly and the posterior complex posteriorly. The anterior complex consists of the posterior surface of the vertebral body, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and the anterior dura. The posterior complex contains the posterior dura and the ligamentum flavum. In young individuals, these two elements can sometimes be distinctly observed in the paramedian sagittal oblique scan. The transducers now turn into tra the transverse orientation. Now, for transverse ultrasound scanning, it starts at the level of the sacrum. The sacrum is represented by a continuous hyperechoic line that stretches across the lower back. From this point, the transducer is tilted, slit in the cranial direction until the sacrum is no longer in view and the ultrasound is able to penetrate through the L5-S1 interspace. This space is often substantially more spacious than the other lumbar interspace, and the neural elements are normally quite distinct. This is also where historically the landmark-based tailless approach to neurexial injection is performed. The interior complex is seen as the hyperechoic element deep along the midline, and the spinal canal can be seen just superficial to it. Occasionally, the posterior complex may be visualized as well. On both sides of the spinal canal, you will find the articular process, again represented by the hyper hyperechoic shadow. Now, sliding the transducer further in the cranial direction, we arrive at the transverse spinous process view. The spinous process of the L5 vertebra is seen in the middle and the lamina on either side of it. Any underlying neural elements are obscured by the acoustic shadow of these bony structures. Thus, this view is not suitable for real-time ultrasound-guided intervention, although it may be used to determine the midline in selected patients. The transducer is then slid in further in the cranial direction, and the transverse interspinous view of the L4-5 interspace is obtained. The interspinous ligament is seen going along the midline, with neural elements including the thecosac sac visualized deep to it. The anterior complex and occasionally the posterior complex are visualized, and on both sides, the articular process and the transverse process can be observed. The systematic scan continues upward, as cranial as the L2 process, Various elements, including the midline as well as the depth towards the spinal canal, may be marked using this approach. As for real-time guided neurexial procedure, an optimal interspace is chosen where all elements are best visualized. Now, as far as um, using ultrasound as a pre-procedural screening tool is concerned, the proceduralist would need to perform both the 
paramedian sagittal scans as well as the transverse scans to identify the relevant anatomical and neuraxial structures, including um, the midline, the appropriate um, spinal vertebral level, um, as well as the depth of the um, target structures, and also the orientation whereby the needle is expected to take in assessing that particular space. The neuraxial injection is then performed using all these predetermined information and estimations to achieve the spinal injection. Now, needle redirection may be necessary during the procedure. The evidence available seems to suggest that such an approach would improve both the success and the quality of epidural analgesia. The correlation between the actual depth of the epidural space and as identified by ultrasound has also been rather consistent. Another area of study in this regard have been the effect of ultrasound on expected difficult neurexial intervention, where results have purported to the beneficial effect of ultrasound in improving the first-time success rate as well as the reduction in needling redirections. The numerous merits, as demonstrated here, have facilitated ultrasound as a tool for screening prior to neurexial procedure. However, there remain some issues left to be addressed. One of the major drawbacks of such an approach is inaccurate skin marking. It could be due to patient movement during um, the period between the skin marking and the procedure itself. Further to that, the cranial caudal orientation of the needle during the procedure could only be estimated by the orientation of the ultrasound during scalp scanning. In addition, in patients with major spinal deformity like scoliosis, where a significant adjustment in needle orientation may be required, there may only be limited utility in application of a pre-procedure scalp scanning. For this reason, there is a clinical need for real-time ultrasound-guided neuraxial intervention. The approach is more technically demanding, and there has been a limited number of reports examining the use of sagittal technique in achieving real-time ultrasound-guided spinal injections. This could be performed in either the sitting, the lateral decubitus, or the prone position. Although in our experience, the orientation of needling is often steep and challenging. The neuraxial elements seen in the saturated views are also less clear than what have been visualized under the transverse views. Therefore, we would prefer to reserve the paramedian saturated views for the purpose of pre-procedure screening only. In our institution, then, we have opted for the transverse approach in achieving central neuraxial block under real-time guide. Essentially, while performing the systematic scanning, the transverse interspinous view over each interspinous space will be judged according to the clarity of neuro and bony elements. The most favorable interspace will then be chosen for the procedure. The needle is introduced from the dependent side in an in-plane approach as illustrated on the right picture and it until the needle reaches the spinal canal via a lateral to medial orientation. We find that the neurostructures are better delineated with this view and the in-plane needling allows for direct visualization of the needle trajectory towards the target neuro tissue. A number of needle redirections may be further reduced compared to the sagittal approach. Ergonomically, the transverse view of the transverse approach is also more flexible and allows for the anesthesiologist to manipulate the needle using his or her dominant hand always. This is regardless of patient positioning. Occasionally, for the paramedian sagittal oblique approach, the anesthetist is forced to use a non-dominant hand in needling, especially for patients lying in the lateral position, adding to the difficulties in an already very challenging procedure. So we believe that this approach with the transverse approach might may obviate such a nuisance. The target site of the needling 
would then be the spinal canal in between two particular processes and superficial to the anterior complex. In this case, as in the spine of many elderly population, the calcification of the interspinous ligament would cast an acoustic shadow over the interspinous space itself, partially obscuring the view of the underlying neurostructures. The introducer needle will first be inserted using an in-plane approach from the dependent side of the transducer. It is often more echogenic than the spinal needle owing to its larger caliber. The needle will be inserted so as to align with the target site, and once introduced, the needle is felt to be engaged with ligamentum flavum. The spinal needle will then be inserted via the introducer needle. It is in our experience that the spinal needle cannot be distinctly visualized in most of the cases, and instead, only tissue movement will be observed on the ultrasound during this insertion. The needle insertion should be gradual and attention be directed to the tactile feeling of the needle engaging with ligamentum flavum and then the puncture of the dura. Therefore, this final bit of the procedure remains blind and the intrathecal axis must be verified by the presence of cerebral spinal fluid. It should be mentioned, however, that oftentimes, the L5 S1 space is indeed the most spacious of all lumbosacral interspace and itself is least affected in patients with spinal deformity or previous spine surgery. A number of reports have made reference to successful spinal injection using this approach in patients with difficult spine. Although the relationship between the dosage of drug and the extent of cranial spread has not been well defined, it has been suggested that a larger amount of drug is required to achieve the same spread as compared to spinal injections in other lumbar interspaces. For this reason, it is our practice to save this space as a last resort in the event that we fail to identify the appropriate inner space at other levels. This is the end of the podcast. I hope audience will find this sharing interesting and applicable to their daily practice. Thank you.